the network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is Connected, episode 15, recorded Monday, October 23rd, 2017. Huddle Spaces, Mergers, and GAFA. Greetings and welcome to AV Nation TV's Connected. My name is David Danto, your host, and uh, I'm here with a kind of year-end forward-looking uh, episode uh, that we do every once in a while with a number of my industry colleagues. I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about them, and then we'll get into themselves, and then we'll get into a, a little bit of uh, what we see going on in the industry. So, uh, Simon, we want to start? Hey, thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Simon Dudley uh, of Logitech. Uh, pleased to be here. A man of a thousand hats. I'm excited about the conversation today. Terrific. David? Hi, my name is David Maldo. I'm the founder and CEO of Let's Do Video, LDV, where we cover business collaboration and team productivity. You can find out everything at letsdovideo.com. Terrific. Thanks, David. And as a special honor, we have the founder of AV Nation TV. Tim is on with us. Go ahead, Tim. Let us uh, give everybody an introduction for the three people that don't know you. Special honor is a stretch. Uh, my name is Tim Albright. I'm the founder and, and and driving force of of, uh, of AV Nation TV, at least that's what my bio says. Um, AV Nation, if you're not familiar, is 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 the, the program, uh, the website you're watching this on. Uh, we're a collection of audiovisual professionals that produce everything from two weeklies, one looking at the weekly news for commercial AV, one looking at the news of the week for residential AV, to collaboration, um, marketing, uh, control and automation, and a host of uh, of other um, niches in within the AV industry. Terrific. Thank you guys for joining me. I'm sure we're going to have a fun conversation today if we're not spending too much time insulting each other. We're all very good friends. Um, so uh, so I, I guess, you know, I want to talk about, um, I, I was honored again this year. I'm going to be a judge for the Consumer Electronics Show. The judging has already passed and I got to see what some of the cool new displays are going to be. I always like to take this time of year around November, December um, and talk about what we've seen in the industry and what we expect to ha ha have coming on and and you know we can talk about collaboration first i mean apparently everybody owns huddle rooms now um and it's the hottest thing in the world simon you were talking about that a little bit before do we see that trend continuing less and less of custom integrated rooms and more and more rooms you buy out of a box and uh, and call huddle rooms a little bit of both perhaps i mean I, I think my first argument would be and i know a lot of people have said that that uh, huddle rooms are killing integrated rooms I'd actually argue they're not really. I think that in my experience, and certainly the numbers we see, is that the number of integrated rooms continues to be what it's always been, a, a relatively small but niche and high v value uh, market. But the huddle rooms are beginning to really take off. And we're seeing incredible growth in that space. I think a lot of people are, it's not just us. And so I think what's happening is the focus is moving to huddle rooms rather than the number of integrated rooms are going down. In fact, you could argue every huddle room that goes in makes those integrated rooms actually more useful because you've got someone else to ring. Well, you, you could argue that, but, you know, I look at this purely from an economic standpoint, at least for, for, for the sake of this argument, in that when we were selling or buying or putting in immersive rooms, you remember going back there in the early 2000s, we were putting in rooms that had 60, 70, even sometimes 80% margin, half a million dollar rooms, and then maybe another half a million dollars to get the room remediated. You know, the, the manufacturers in the space were making a heck of a lot of money. Um, there was a lot of room to do, you know, free design or all the support, higher a lot of people, guys. You, we all know, sitting on their boats, watching the numbers come in um, on the on their accounts that they're <laughs> they're in charge with. I won't, won't mention the name there, um, but uh, but hi, he knows who he is. Um, and um, and and now, you know, we're selling really good systems for about a thousand bucks, plus or minus yeah. the the processor and PC. How are the big companies staying in business? By the way, everybody, jump in. I'm not going to call on you if you got something to say. Say. Yeah, I, I'll jump in. I I agree with Simon on this. I, I don't see them as they're slightly overlapping, but I don't see them as competitive markets. There's the, the market for integrated rooms with this, the high-end executive suites, the boardrooms, the rooms where you have the budget for that. But now there's this new market, and yeah, it's it's less of a sale per room for, for our integrator friends, but there's so much more of them. And, um, you know, it, it, is, this, is this just the buzzword of the day, or is this real? I think it's very real because everyone's excited, and, and particularly the end users. You talk to end users, and they say, we're building new facilities, completely open, 
everyone doesn't have a cubicle, everyone is, is on the floor, and they need privacy with their teams to work. So we built all these little rooms on the side. What do we put in those rooms? Well, you're never going to put, it's not taking away from the integrated market. You were never going to put a, a $20,000 system in that room. So it's a, it's a new market and the huddle room is, is perfect for them. And, um, you know, and, and that's why I, I think there's so much excitement for it because there's an actual need. It's not use this and get ROI. It's they're coming to us and saying, Hey, what do we put in these rooms? See, I, I would take a little bit, a little bit different stance on that, uh, David, in the fact that I don't think I don't see it as an as a new market. I I, th I see it as supplanting the old market, right? Um, you've got, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the the, the time frame that, that David's talking about, you had twenty thousand, thirty thousand, fifty thousand dollar meeting rooms, right? We called them conference rooms, and a lot of times you would put VTC in there, you know, video video conferencing in there. Those units themselves would would range anywhere between ten thousand and and forty thousand dollars. With a, in addition, and, and you have a service agreement with that. Um, you've got a control system that ranges somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, five to seven thousand dollars for for just the hardware, and then you've got the programming. And the, so it was it was a significant investment. And they realized that they weren't using them, or at least not using them to their full potential. And then they're doing the open office space, right? Where you've got, you know, these these open ar office architectures where you're right, you, you've got to have then little small meeting rooms, but you don't need everything in those rooms. And so they're, they're pulling back a little bit and they're saying, okay, what, what exactly are, are we using? And this is actually where a little bit of, of um, the, uh, the analytics are, are coming into at least our space saying, okay, um, what are we using? Right. We're building a new facility, our old facility, or, or you know, we're, we're outfitting this new floor, the old floor. What did we use? What buttons did we press? What devices did we use? And this is the same in corporate as well as as, as education. I, I'm an old, you know, used to be a tech manager years and years ago. And I remember rolling out our first asset management software. And, and the, the information we gathered was incredibly valuable because when an instructor would come to you and say, you know what, our dot cam, which if you're not familiar with that, a dot cam is a, is a, is a device that takes a piece of, you know, any, anything and, and shoots a camera at it. And then you can take it up on a screen and it's a version of Im image magnification. Our dot cam is busted. We have to have one tomorrow, right? It, it's got to be replaced immediately, if not sooner. As facility managers and as as the people that, that ran the, the facilities, we could take a look at the analytics of that room specifically and go, you know what? You really don't because you only used it once in the last two years, right? So you take that information and you, when you're building out your next building or you're doing the, the next renovation of technology, you could say, you know what, guys? You haven't used a VCR in 15 years. Can we take this out now, right? You don't need it. Or this room was never really used for VTC. You never really made a call in this room once in the last 12 months. Is there a way that we can adjust this and save some money um, and then, you know, maybe build a bigger one or, or build a, a more outfitted one or two on a floor as opposed to giving every single room a, a dedicated VTC? Then well, you've got software <laughs> that, so that so allows let, you to do that me... anyway. Let me uh, let me uh, let me chat. Uh, I think challenge this idea Mr. Danto came up with of of um, you know we've had this market and it made people lots of money. Uh, according to Wayne House, two and a half percent of meeting rooms have got video conferencing in. Now Today. I, as was almost everyone in this call, involved for the last twenty five years. So it, it's pretty disturbing for me that after twenty five years of hard toil one in 40 meeting rooms have video conferencing in. So I think one could realistically say we failed, right? As an industry, it's not as if we've had this lovely market and everyone's buying it and it's made everyone tons of money. It's made a few people some money, but it hasn't really taken off. And well, when I, when I walk into a client, I, I get a, a, a kind of a different perspective from, from you, Tim, and I understand what you're saying, Simon. It's, it's, we walk in and I say, well, where's your room? And, and the, the admins, and the junior people and the team people will always bring me to the room and they'll always tell me why they're not using it. The reason they're not using it is because, oh, it's the CEO's room. It was built for the CEO. We're not, we're lowly people. We're not going to go in over there. Or they'll tell me, what are you kidding? I'm not going to touch that thing. Um, I, I, I got to get somebody from IT or somebody from AV into the room to touch it. So we were making the mistake, and I say this in every one of my client presentations, we have been building these collaboration systems for us.
for the two percent, for the guys that used to be able to make the VCR clock stop flashing, and 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 the people that understand how to program the settings on their phones. We are the wrong audience. We are absolutely not the users of this room. Everybody else wants to walk into the room and have it do one or two things really easily, and 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 not have to touch anything or learn anything. All these leave behind sheets. If it was so complicated that it needed a sheet, we shouldn't have built it in the first place. That's why the rooms that I'm seeing, even outside of Huddle Rooms, are getting a drop-in system from Cisco or a drop-in system from Polycom because nobody wants to touch this stuff anymore. Well, oh, and... They're, they're and using... Go ahead. Sorry, and the issue is that you stuck it in the boardroom. Well, most of your average guy in the office isn't allowed in the boardroom, right? They'll get shooed out by the CEO secretary. So if you stick it in there, it's already exclusive. So there is that sense of... If you think of it in these terms, and I love this analogy because it might be true, that... <laughs> The roads were built not for the Mercedes and the Rolls Royces. They were built for the Model T Fords, and the Mercedes and the Rolls Royces got to use them. But there's no question that the road system in America and everywhere else in the world, because they were a third of all the cars that existed uh, in the 20s, were Model T Fords. And I think that the modern huddle spaces are the Model T Fords. They're the things that build out the network that everything else gets to take advantage of. And what do those? What what is the Model T Ford? The Model T Ford currently, as we sit here today, we're using it right now as we record. It's a soft codec, right? Yeah. You know, uh, Simon in in one one of his versions of his past life used to work for a dedicated hardware VTC manufacturer. Those jobs and and that that model is going away rapidly, and the the ability to walk into a space, I don't care what you call it, a huddle room, a collaboration room, whatever. And come in and with your laptop or with a simple, you know, push of a button to, to David's point, you can connect with somebody else, someplace else, and have a collaborative experience. That software, the, the software-defined codec is what really is, is driving a lot of this innovation, but also driving a lot of the design. But we I'd, also I'd like give to second up a that. lot. Oh. Okay, good, David. Yeah, I'd like to second that. Part of the, um, the reason that I'm so excited about Huddle Rooms is I have friends who are our camera vendors. I mean, the usual suspects, I don't have to name them, but uh, a, a, a independent people who make cameras. And they've been telling me um, when they would walk in with their camera and demo it and try to explain how it's affordable for a huddle room and covers and this and, you know, all, all the features they talk about, they have whatever percentage of closing the sale. When they come in as, a, as part of a software kit, whether from, from a cloud service like the one we're using or its competitors, and they say, hey, you buy it as part of this kit, it comes with a Nook, you know, the whole deal, and then they demo it. It's like the sales are just closing. It's just the consumers get that, and so um, from a from a vendor point of view, it's an it's an easier sale to sell a huddle room system than to sell components. And the users just seem to be like, oh yeah, oh. And, and like Tim was saying, so it's not all this complicated stuff. I don't need an IT person to schedule it. It's just like using desktop video. I mean, it, it basically is. It is. You know, the, the it is the same software as desktop video. Uh, click to join. They're done. The problem that I see in that model, um, not that I disagree with any of you, but the problem that I see is if you're in a small to medium business and you've got 10 rooms or 20 rooms, you know, and, and, and when something doesn't work, you deal with it fine. When you're in a large enterprise, when you're talking about, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 people, and you've got thousands and thousands of these rooms out there, and they're all running, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a Windows operating system with a USB camera plugged into them, and something goes wrong and you don't know until somebody tries and uses it. I think what we what we've we've seen the hardware move forward, but we haven't seen the ability to manage it in scale move forward. That's been missing from almost all the manufacturers of these huddle room spaces. And, and I'm 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 aware. I know a couple other people are that I think that's going to be one of the things we're going to see changing going forward. That there is going to be some management strategy around this. I mean, uh, anybody else have any thoughts around that? Agree entirely, David, is the simple answer. If you actually look at it, though, you know, even in the US, right, which is a huge number of Fortune 2000, 5000 companies, um, something like 93% of the population does not work for one of those. So if we're talking about the mass deployment of video, the fat middle market and, the, and smaller is probably bigger, more important at some level. Uh, I do agree with you that, uh, that we need to get better tools at a PC level. But of course, you could also argue that IT managers have been running enormous estates of large numbers of PCs for donkey's years. They just haven't been doing it in video. 
Now to get some of those tools to, to cope with additional things like USB connected devices, I agree would be very nice and it should be done. Uh, I think a lot of people are realizing that that's an interesting opportunity. Well, we're starting to see some of the people, you know, because the huddle room space is so hot, we've spent a lot of time on it, but be, because it's so hot, um, we're seeing a lot of the manufacturers who are traditionally in the larger system space saying, oh my God, I don't want this market to take off without us and introduce some pretty cool, flexible products. Some of them have joint ventures with some of the cloud providers. Um, I, I think we've seen some interesting pieces, certainly, you know, from your company, from Logitech. Um, we've seen some interesting pieces from Crestron. You're starting to see Intel and some of the other organizations, Lenovo, they're getting into this space. Um, and, and, you know, keep your eyes open for, for Crestron to do something very very different. I think they're going to, you know, be moving into this management space of these huddle rooms in a very big way with a tool nobody's ever seen before, um, which I think is going to kind of upend and disrupt. You know, if, if we take a look at um, what's going on with cameras now in the huddle room space, we've got, I think, three cameras on the market right now that do that intelligent tracking that can see if somebody's in the room and can make a good shot of that. And I believe that's table stakes going forward. When you have a large manufacturer coming in and presenting their huddle room system and saying, oh, by the way, here's the cloud connected console so you can manage the whole thing and you don't need an IT programmer to build it it's just there and it's easy I think that's going to become table stakes in the industry as well no absolutely because you've got IT managers who actively need this information um, we, we talked about this before where you know the the movement of AV equipment onto the network right and I don't care what you, you call it I'm, I'm tired of the word convergence so I'm not going to use it um, but IT managers need to see what the uh, the AV stuff is doing. And because, let's be honest, it's an IT product now, right? Um, and so giving them that information in a quick and easy and, con a, and digestible form is absolutely imperative. Um, the, the movement by Crestron and there are some other companies that are also doing similar sorts of software suites where they're giving you an entire um, ecosystem view of what your network, what the AV products on your network is doing. And, and managing and being able to manage them in a in a simple to use interface and companies like that you're right are going to be able to sustain over the long period you know I, i'm not sure if we're there with it being uh table stakes yet the intelligent tracking stuff i'm, I'm really you know david got me excited when he started talking about it because it's such a sexy topic and um it, it should and it will be table stakes soon but right now, it is one of the sexiest things in our industry. And and just because for so many reasons, first of all, it fixes meetings. If someone came in and sat next to me now, they would get framed. The camera would move over and they would be framed. If if that person left, it would frame me again. That alone makes a meeting so much more uh, productive and natural. But the really great part is the analytics. I, I mean, these cameras are going to know not just when a meeting happens, which is what we have from our current analytics, you know, we know there's a call at, at this time on this system. They're going to know how many people are in the room and who is in the room. I think of that from a facilities point of view, you have a 20-person meeting room and you find out the average meeting size is six people. Well, that's going to affect the design of the next room as you grow. And, and if you find out that one guy David's always taken the room for himself. You're going to have a talk with David. This room's always booked and you're booking it for yourself. We don't know that now. Uh, but these intelligent cameras are the key to finding all that out and and much more. I mean, this is just the top of my head kind of stuff. So um, I, I'm, I'm with David's excitement over the uh, intelligent cameras that they're not table stakes. Um, I want them to be soon. We're also seeing a lot of move uh, into the space from some of the higher tech firms. And look at what we're talking about. We're talking about cameras that are smart enough to understand uh, how to make a shot, how many people in the room. And then, you know, you add a little bit of cloud intelligence to that and you know who they are and you know what their meetings are, you know what their preferences. We're moving rapidly into a voice first world where, you know, if I, if I, if I pick up my phone and, and, and use the trigger word and ask it, you know, to call my wife, it just does. I don't even need to have picked up my phone. I just say it. You know, that's been a, it's, it's, it's a barrier to putting that into an enterprise environment has been an always on connected live microphone. But, you know, there are ways around that and making that protectable and, and, and keeping the data in house. 
the best user interface is no user interface. We're starting to learn that. We walk into a room and say, start my meeting, or, or say, hey, trigger word, start my meeting, and then everything starts. And again, I think going into next year, we're just going to see more and more and more of that. Um, we're, we're this whole concept of, you know, and again, forgive me industry, but the cash cow of custom programming of touch panels is just going to go away because it's not going to be needed anymore. And here's the thing, and you you said the best interface is no interface. I would even take it a step further and say the best interface is no is no unlock word. Um, you know, most you you mentioned Fortune 500 and Fortune you know 1,000 companies. A lot of these folks have some sort of key card system. What happens if David Danto walks in with his key card into the conference room, into the meeting space, and it it notices that, compares that to the the meeting that's already scheduled, and then automatically starts, right? Well, there key card, it, it could be key card, it could be, which is RFID, it could be Bluetooth beacon, it, it can be uh, facial recognition, it can be yep. any one of the triggers that access the big data. But that it takes that then and says, okay, David's in, Danto is in the room, now we can start the meeting, and, and it can do everything that it's already been pre-programmed in the back end to do. Um, I, I will, as a, as a, as a one-time con, you know, control programmer, uh, I, I, would say, I would actually agree with you about the interface, right? It's going away. The other, th the other the other side of that is there is still a need. If you have a, a traditional audio visual control system, there's still going to be a need of video you know, to have some sort of of master control or or control room interface. Now, it does it have to be in every single room? Most likely not. But somewhere in 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 the facility system is going to have to be a a, a interface to say, okay, you know what? This time it didn't happen, right? He walked, you know, David walked into the room and the system didn't start for whatever reason. So let's troubleshoot that and let's force the meeting to start. Now, that doesn't have to be a, a fancy smancy $15,000 touch panel somewhere in a control room. It can be a computer interface, right? It can be a, a, a web, a, a web, a web server-based you know, um, interface, but there has to be some sort of ability for at least the facilities and the IT people to force something to happen in case, the, in, in case of a failure. Well, and here's something else to consider, right? I, I've been in the industry forever, and every company I've ever worked for told me that uh, to tell the clients that the new user interface we'd come up with was intuitive, and the users would automatically know how to use it, and everyone would feel comfortable with it. And, um, of course, back to uh, Mr. Danto's point earlier about users are terrified of using this technology. And part of that is because it's big and scary, and if you press the wrong button, it will explode and kill everyone in the building, right? I mean, that's the first rule of video conferencing. The second rule is that most people are more afraid of public humiliation than they are of death. Uh, as Jerry Seinfeld said, that means that most people would rather give the, uh, would rather be in the box than give the eulogy at a funeral. Um, difficult to prove one way or the other, but the whole point with these user interfaces is that no one knows how to use them because like you said, David, earlier about the flashing lights on the front of your VCR, because you had to program it every six months when the clock changed, and you only did it every six months, you always forgot. And the problem with video is that no one, most people, never get familiar enough with these user interfaces. So I personally think, I agree with everything you say about face recognition and all the, and it's coming and it's gonna be exciting. But in the medium term, I think one of the nicest user interfaces is whatever you're used to. I mean, I'm a Mac user. I can't use a PC. Someone gave me Windows 10. I couldn't make anything work. I, I had to hand back the Surface Pro. But other people know, don't know how to use a Mac. So user interfaces are all about familiarity. And I think that's the way the market's going anyway, which is also bad news for programmers, by the way. All right, if I, um, I, I'm booking my end of year travel right now, and if I book a trip um, to, to one of my clients and book the hotel, and I get an email back that says, you know, your hotel is booked, the next time I look for how to get to that hotel on Google Map, all of a sudden it says on the map that I'm staying there, you know, December 4th to 6th. Um, that's the concept of big data working. You know, Google's got that down, you know, that it gets the data automatically from other sources um, and it puts it in. How much longer do you think it's going to be before Google and Amazon and some of these other companies that are that are slamming on big data are just going to walk into our space and say, you know, or, or for, for, for lack of a better colloquial term, they're going to Uber us. 
Um, you know, it's you, you see it starting now. They're just pinching around the edges. But, you know, you can walk into your, your home uh, 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 video version of Alexa and tell it to call grandma, and it does. And at some point, some CEO is going to walk in and say, this stuff works at home. Why do I have a staff of 50 people and I can't get it to work in the office? Yeah, a, a funny uh, big data story. This happened a year or so ago. I was out at lunch with a friend uh, at a place that I, I normally don't go to. So I, as we finished up lunch, I took up my phone, opened Google Maps, and I typed in home. And he saw me do that. And he said, oh, you, you taught your app to, to you know, you, you, you programmed your home address. So you just have to type in home. That's pretty cool. I said, no, I, I didn't. Open up your phone, open up Google Maps and type in home. And you what? Opened up his phone, he typed in home, and it put his address, and he freaked out a little bit. I'm like, Google knows where you live. You got you to get used to that. Um, and of course, we're going to see that trickle into the workplace. Go ahead. Um, um, I, I, would, I would be remiss, Simon, if I didn't let you say your, your we're the product line there. Well, frankly, I joined Logitech just over a year ago now, because I believe so strongly in what you just said. I mean, I think that the market is in that transition. And and, and this is truly the only advert I'll throw out for what we do, but I'm excited about what we do, and that's the reason I'm saying it, is we're the input devices for all of those things. I mean, so are other people, and they all make great products and all those things, but I think that's the way the industry's going, in that a ton of big data behind it, whether it's Amazon or Google or Microsoft or Facebook or a thousand other great companies that produce products, um, you need input devices, and you know that's what Logitech's always done, whether it's a mouse, a keyboard, or a webcam. They're all input devices to that environment. So it's pretty exciting from our point of view where that market's going, but it certainly have a huge disruption on much of it. Very exciting. Well, let's let's talk about that disruption a little bit as a group, because, you know, over the last year, um, I, Tim, you probably know the numbers off the top of your head better than I do, but we have seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Um, so a few of them in the manufacturing and, and, and development side, uh, a lot of them on the AV integration side where we're seeing smaller firms be bought up by bigger firms and everybody's saying, wow, look at how active our industry is. We're cheering and this is great and all this terrific stuff. And, you know, personally, I look at it and say, oh, you know, it's play the queen song. Another one bites the dust. We're looking at the death throes of the AV integration industry, or at least the beginnings of them. I'm not saying doom and gloom, but, you know, what do you guys feel about all the activity that we're seeing? I mean, it's obviously going to change integration. It's going to change manufacturing. Any thoughts or ideas about whether or not we're going to see more of that going forward? So there's there's two things. The one is 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 a apocryphal story uh, from a consultant friend of mine out in the in the Bay Area, and um, this was August, July or August of this year. Um, one company bought another company. They were both already in in the Bay Area, and he is a consultant, so he has to you know he makes has relationships with in, in, integrators to get them on their bid list and this that and the other. And he's like, look, this this is a horrible thing for the industry because now suddenly instead of three companies to bid on your project, you have two, right? So it's, it doesn't serve the client uh, because you, you have less competition. It doesn't serve the consulting industry because again, you have less competition for, for your projects. Um, from a financial standpoint, and, and you know, you know AVISPL is, is owned by an investment firm and that's one of the merchants and acquisitions. Um, and talking with another integrator friend of mine who, happened to, who happens to be up in, in Toronto, he had, he thinks it's great because instead of having two competitors now suddenly he only has he has he has one less competitor. Um, but I look at this and I go, okay, this how big can you get without toppling under your own weight? Um, and I don't want to you know say speak, speak doom and gloom, but you know, the the question becomes you know the, the, all of us who have been in the, around in the industry for longer than fifteen or twenty years, we've all seen at least two or three of these. Yep. Companies, right, where they've gotten so big and it's been great and you know, there was money flowing like wine and it was great until the time came to pay the check. And um, there had, there's a good possibility that, that there's going to become a time when somebody's got to pay the check and there may be a lot of people out of work or, or, or looking for a new uh, new place of employment. Those who uh, do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, right? Amen, brother. You know, I think my comment would be, um, and I agree with you, Tim and David, for that matter, that it, these companies aren't necessarily better because they're bigger. And the reason they're probably not better because they're bigger is because in, and of course, not in any case of anyone who's actually listening to this, you're all wonderful people, but many organizations don't have a management team that's capable of coping 
with a multi-billion dollar business. The, the, the level or the difference between the people who are good at the 10 to $50 million businesses, the mindset, the way you work, the way you turn this company into almost a personality cult, right? One guy can manage all these things. Once it gets above a certain scale, they can't, and they need much more professional, different types of management. And in my experience, most of these companies don't do that. They, they, they build the, the edifice in the same way they did the $50 million business, and now it's a billion-dollar business, and it doesn't work at that level. you got level. sergeants being generals all of a sudden. Yes. You, you're using, you're using uh, columns to build skyscrapers, and it's like it was all right to build the Acropolis, but it's not all right to build the Burj Al Arab. Uh, you know, I, also, Burj Khalifa. Wow. I, I also see that um, <laughs> that uh, you when you there's a tendency on the sell side of the industry to promote people who've done a really good job selling. I think you've written about this too, uh, Simon, is that, <laughs> you know, you, you get some guy who really, you know, blasted through his quota for three years and suddenly you make him a manager and he may be or she may be a great salesperson, but being a great manager, especially nowadays when that means managing our remote staff and understanding personal feelings and, and being a relatable person, those are usually the opposite uh, qualities from somebody who does sales. So we wound up, we wind up rewarding salespeople by giving them management positions they're not qualified for and it's usually a disaster. It's a, and it, unfortunately, it's a disaster for both the individual who now earns much less than they ever did when they were a good salesperson. And all the best salespeople I've ever met, and me being one of them, it, it are deeply selfish because you have to be to be good, right? There's that sense of it's Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, right? They're fantastic gunslingers. They're great at shooting people in the streets. They're terrible leaders of men. That's not what they ever designed. That's not what they wanted to do. You turn Butch Cassidy into General Gautieri, and it's a mess. And uh, I think that's it, it's bad news for everybody concerned. And if we look at that a little bit from the other side, not so much the integration firms, but some of the manufacturing firms, if I go back to my analogy of booking my end of year travel, I now have four airlines that I can choose from and only one of them flies directly from my uh, nonstop from my local airport um, and it sucks. And they all suck because they don't need to be good because there aren't a lot of choices anymore. We've seen a tremendous amount of, uh, of M&A in the industry on the manufacturing side. You know, certainly, you know, Samsung Harman, you know, one of the leaders that happened, you know, uh, you know, in, in recent past, and and as we're we're recording today, there, there's another one where where you know Cisco is a buying machine, and I know Simon, you wanted to talk about that a little bit. I did. It's interesting, and um, very recently, the Cisco broad, Broadsoft uh, scenario came up. So, Cisco in theory is going to close in Q1 next year in 2018. Um, Cisco has announced that they want to buy Broadsoft for 1.9 billion dollars. I personally think it's very interesting in the sense that Broadsoft have been a purveyor of effectively white label service solutions for other people and people like AT&T and Verizon and a bunch of others actually who you don't get to know about uh, use this service and it's a very good product uh, or, or platform perhaps is the right turn of phrase. It interests me because, and of course I don't know the answer, it's going to be fascinating to know what does that mean from Cisco's point of view? They've said they want to get into services. Broadsoft gives them that. But what does that mean from a from a call manager, Cisco, Spark, you know, Jabber, WebEx, video conferencing perspective? Does that mean they got two solutions, two whole platforms? I don't know the answer. It's very early days. Uh, we can discuss it, and I'll be excited to see what happens. Well, it, it, I don't think I actually think it's a it's a natural evolution. Maybe not that broad soft specifically, but but a company like that. Um, about a month or so ago, John Chambers. If you're not familiar with John Chambers, Google him. He's, he's been he was at at Cisco for shut off the webcast. If you're years. not familiar with John Chambers, shut this off. You know you have no business watching it. But but go on. Okay, shut shut off the webcast. So John Chambers, long time Cisco guy. Um, uh, stepped down as, as as CEO last year, stepped down from the board this year, uh, about a month or so ago. And in that same announcement, which I found curious, they also, Cisco also announced a move towards software, right? A move away from the hardware, especially in, in the VTC side. Now, before I say this, understand Cisco will probably, I'm going to say this and, and I'll be turned wrong, Cisco will probably never stop making switches, right? It, it, this is That's the backbone of a network. But they are moving 
with all their other products and everything, they're moving towards a software world, right? We've talked already about the 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 soft codec VTC. Uh, Spark is in that line. Um, all these other all their other product offerings are in that software line, and that gives you two things. First of all, you no longer have to worry about the maintaining of hardware, but it also gives you another thing we've talked about, and that's the data. That's the analytics that allows you to do things like, you know, if you're at a, you, you, when you walk into a room for Cisco to know that you're in that room and do all this magical things. And, oh yeah, by the way, you, 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 David Danto only averages 43 minutes out of the hour he always books. So guess what? We're going to start adjusting your automatic time for 45 minutes, things of that nature and freeing up the rooms and freeing up the spaces and giving us all this data back. I, I actually think it's a, it's a natural evolution. Again, not necessarily um, that company specifically, but it makes sense. Well, it also gives you, just very briefly, it also gives Cisco or anyone else who buys a service play a much better valuation moving forwards. Because well, that's the, because the, the, it's an annuity play like we were talking about. The hardware doesn't have a lot of margin. Um, yep. And software, you know, gives you licensing, gives you that automatic revenue coming in monthly, yearly. That's, you know, that's what I've been telling all of my clients for the last two years is no matter what these large firms are trying to sell you, no matter what they tell you the product is, they're trying to get you on their platform so they can start charging you monthly on an ongoing basis. That's the goal of everything, whether it's a, a ride on board or, 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 or a camera system or anything else. Their goal is they want you in that licensing package. And that's where the, where, where the dog fights are taking place. Absolutely. Yeah, recurring, yeah, recurring revenue. I mean, you know, you sell a switch and two years later, you hope you can sell that person the upgraded version of the switch or whatever the hardware is. Uh, but you sell a software service. And especially now that we're not, you know, it used to be you'd have to sell software every few years, Adobe Premiere Pro 5, Adobe Premiere Pro 6. Now people just license it. You know, Windows 10 is going to be the last Windows. I'm never going to buy. No one's going to sell me Windows ever again. I'm just going to keep, I guess, well, that's not what I pay for. But you get the idea. If you're paying for Spark, you just keep paying for Spark. It's it's, and I feel I feel like it's a more, I don't know, more honorable, but it's a more tasteful way of getting recurring revenue. I I really felt, not cheated, but I felt like it was a, a little bit of a, a sneaky move when you'd buy a piece of hardware. But if if you wanted to work, you got to buy the service contract, which is their way of getting recurring revenue for several thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life. That felt like I don't want to be paying for that, but I'll pay. X dollars a month for a service and give you recurring re revenue that way. Yeah, perhaps there is the issue, of course, that um, that you do the reoccurring revenue until you don't need it anymore, and then you stop using it, and then all your files um, that you own you can't read anymore because you didn't continue to. So you got to be careful about being locked in. I think that brings us back to the whole idea, as Mr. Danto said, about you get locked into a, a position because. You know, Dave lives near Newark. You're you're pretty near Newark, right, Dave? So yes. you you have basically one choice of airline, and and I live in Austin, so it's equally terrible for everywhere. So I have a whole choice of uh, of air, airlines, all of which are pretty terrible for me. Um, you get locked in, right? The airline industry has effectively disentangled each other. Right? American and United, and and uh, maybe Southwest do a bit, but American and United don't compete anymore because. If you're an American person or you're a United person, and that's it. And one wonders if that's going to happen in, in the AV industry as well, or the VC or the IT, whatever it is. You could argue it's already happened. You're a Cisco yeah. house, you're a Microsoft house. So what are we? That's a great point, and I'm going to I'm going to transition rapidly on that one. What are we calling ourselves anymore? Because that's been coming up in a couple of things, and as we're planning programming for uh, uh, a Vix's Infocom show in 2018, see, I got that right. Um, <laughs> Are we still calling this UCNC? Is this still unified communication? Uh, I, I, I'm of a mind to like throw that all out and just simply call it collaboration, which covers both the AV side and the, and the UC side. Well, what, what are you guys hearing? What are, what are we calling what the heck it is that we're doing? I think we should do what the UK, the UK had a problem that all these TV channels were called Gold Plus and TV Channel 2 and all these ridiculous things. And some guy in a marketing department just said, this is ridiculous, just call it Dave. And there is a TV channel in the UK called Dave. So we can't call it Dave. And anyway, we've got too many Davids in this industry. We'll have one, one of the most calls. intelligent channels there. And so, yeah, so we're going to call it, it Derek. Jim, what do you think? Call it Derek. 
Well, I, I like collaboration, but I also like communication. I mean, let's let's be let's boil it down to exactly what we're doing, right? I mean, you you take it back all the way back to you know to Bell, and with with the telephone, and this is just an evolution of that. We're communicating. We're communicating communicating ideas. We're communicating thoughts, whether it's over the phone, whether it's over VoIP, um, which anymore you know phone is 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 an antiquated term. Uh, I think, uh, but you know, whether it's text or whether it's, you know, you and I sharing a document, we are communicating and, and by extension, we're collaborating. Yeah. I'm, I'm with Tim on this. I've been just going with the literal, keep it simple. Literally what I talk about, what I write about is business communications and, and some of it's audio, some of it's video, a lot more of it's becoming IM and text, but it's people who are at work, who are communicating with other people that are at work with just business communications, keep it simple. And, and I've been expanding on it because I, I think as we're getting to the point where, well, you know what, this video stuff works. This, this call has been going on for a while. I've seen no hiccups. I'm on a regular PC. I mean, the stuff works now. So covering, Oh, what protocol are we using and what bandwidth are we getting? That's going to get more and more boring. What's going to become more and more interesting is what are the people using this stuff for? team productivity. What's happening in these huddle rooms? I'm excited about agile. I'm excited about getting things done. So I say business communications and team productivity, and hopefully the end team productivity will become bigger and louder. Well, you've actually given me another rapid pivot point that we can go to with what you were just talking about around the idea of this team, team chat, team workspaces, work stream communication, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the upstart Slack, which I see is going to now be a keynote speaker at Enterprise Connect, which is interesting because they didn't even recognize the conference the last five years. But all right, yeah. so the, you've got that. You've got Cisco Spark, which you've mentioned quite a bit. We've got, you got Microsoft mentioning that, they're, you know, they're transitioning from Skype for Business over to their Teams thing. If you guys think back five Five, six, seven years ago, all of us at these industry conferences that we all attended, we were talking about how interoperability is table stakes. And we've got it right now. I didn't pre-check any of the equipment with you guys. I, we used, you know, BlueJeans. Thank you very much, BlueJeans, for being the first cloud interoperability service. There are others around as well, but thank you for letting us use your technology. We don't even think about it anymore. We send out the meeting. Everybody just joins with what they have, and it's fine. And then this team chat world comes along and drops a bomb on interoperability. None of these systems talk with each other. Few of them allow chat chats outside of the enterprise, you know, the, the some are a little bit better than others. You have to be on their platform. You have to be using one of their branded platforms. It's almost like we've we've taken the industry back 20 years to where we were talking about how you can't connect a polycom call from a Cisco system and we need a least common denominator. We don't even have the least common denominator anymore. How will that affect what we're doing? Personally, I think it's in the, an evolution. If you look at the technology, you look at all, every technology goes through these stages. It goes from impossible, can't be done at all, to the to barely possible, where the user has to work around the technology. Think Pichatel Concord um, from the late 90s to uh, a, a more modern environment, and I won't pick a, a winner for that, it's too modern, uh, where the user works around the te sorry the technology works around the user, and then you end up with a technology effectively dissolving into a workflow. And a little bit to your point, Dave, about the the whole way that the manufacturers or the the suppliers in aircraft, for example, are disentangling each other from their competition. You have players today who are disentangling themselves from an open environment, right? If, if I can, if I'm a big player and I can run a walled garden, you bet I'm going to run a walled garden because it's a lot more profitable. It's a lot harder for my users to get out of. And therefore, if people can produce an environment that, that users like and IT managers like, and they can lock people in and you can name any major manufacturer and, and basically say that at a, at a cloud level, then good you know i say good for them is it good for the users well it gives the users what they want is it good long term mm, yet to be found out but it's an interesting point that as the technology becomes part of something larger then the actual number of opportunities for it sort of shrink at some level or the opportunities to to do multiple things but yeah, that, that, that's driven by the client though that's driven by the customer because you know, if if Microsoft if Microsoft thought it could get away with not making a, an Office suite for for Macs, it would do it, right? 
But the reason they make one is because their users said, look, I live and work in a Mac environment. I love your product, but I can use Keynote as easily as I can use PowerPoint. You make me a PowerPoint for Mac, I'll sure as heck use it. And so those walls come down when the clients and the users demand it. And, and there's a business case for it, right? There's a business use, uh, a business case to be made for bringing those walls down and, and starting the, like you said, the, the creation of the, of the workflow and the integration of these products that aren't so segmented, but they start integrating with the actual uh, users' daily, daily lives. I would agree, Tim, but it, it requires, you got to get to the, your nice certain platform and then you open it up. And I think we're at the, you know, you look at all the major players, you look at Microsoft or Cisco or others, and those guys have a platform that is very nice to live in, but it's pretty hard to get out of. Um, I think that you're right, that user Some demand another, will require. Yeah, yeah oh, I, I, and I, I'm not even in a position to give you a, a technical breakdown as to which is better. Um, and they're all wonderful products. I mean, truly, they're really, users seem to love them in all cases, um, but the opportunities to break out of those environments and do other things uh, is is not great right now. And I suspect it will get easier because of, as Tim's point is, uh, because of user demand moving forward. I certainly hope well, so. I'm, I'm a little concerned around the entire chat workspace, and I'm a very heavy user of multiple platforms, and I love them all, and I'm using multiple of them with you guys, you know, and for, for, for many occasions. So you know I'm a heavy user, not saying a bad word about it. But it's an interesting Me Too phenomenon that we're dealing with right now in that, you know, Slack obviously opened up the space and created this platform sideways, wasn't what they were intending to do, that created this great collaboration for small to medium businesses. And it started to take over market share for small to medium businesses. And my experience of all of the team workflow products that I've used to date, I've seen them successful, very successful. I mean, to the point of giving up email at many small to medium businesses. And I've also seen them successful for teams. Like if I'm starting a new project for a client and there are eight or 10 or 12 of us on the on that project team and I put everybody into one room and we can all share documents and do things. I mean, it's a tremendously time-saving, valuable process to use. But as soon as you start to try and scale that, you get into an interesting phenomenon that you're going to find one or two or three or 10 or 10% 10 of the people that have not adopted the new workflow. They still use email. They're not loading any new apps. They're not doing anything else. And as soon as your team space now has a participant that won't participate, now you've doubled your work. Now you're sending everything out to the team online. And at the same time, you're taking what's in the team space that somebody put in and copying it over via email to somebody else or sending it out of the space via email. I don't see, you know, five years from now, there are going to be small to medium businesses that have completely changed their workflow. Um, maybe some educational environments, classrooms, small groups. I don't see this as taking over the way it's being touted to take over right now. now that's just me. Uh, I'm open to hearing what you guys think for is the going forward for this kind of space. Well, I think, David, you've already pointed out, right, that to change it for a huge corporate is much harder for them than for a team or an individual, you know, or for a small company. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know which one will win. I don't think there will ever be one winner, but I think lots, I, I think that it will take over in the same way that I remember 25 years ago, there were people who said, I don't do email. Well, how do you read all the emails your people send them? Oh, my secretary prints them out and I read them on the train on the way home. You know, and you're stabbing your face with a fork thinking, what is this idiot doing, right? And they did it for a while, and then they either got with a program or, or they were, they were um, moved on in whatever format. I, I think that will happen with this stuff. Do you, do you, I don't remember if you guys remember this, this short-lived product by, by Google. Uh, it was called Wave. And Wave's, one of Wave's biggest selling points at the time was email is broken. And I, I think that thought and that idea – was a seed. Now, Wave unfortunately has has gone by the way of, of so many other Google products, but that thought and that idea was a seed and has stuck with so many folks, especially, you know, especially folks of, of our generation. The fact that we we grew up with 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 email, we we all four probably remember our very first email addresses. I'm not going to give you mine because it's incredibly embarrassing, um, but it was Hotmail. Let's just put it that way. Um, but but the idea that you know. I'm going to send you an email and then I'm going to wait, you know, 
a, a day or two or, or weeks in, in Simon's case. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, for, for a response. And then by that time, I'm going to read back. And then if there's three or four or five of us on this same email chain, then I'm going to have to go through and see everybody else's responses. That's archaic. I mean, that we might as well be writing on a wall and waiting for somebody else to continue, you know, writing in chalk. Whether or not you know Spark or or Slack is going to be is going to be the one to win them all. Who who knows? But the idea of collaborating in a written format like this is incredibly exciting. It's 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 very enticing for folks who see email as quote unquote broken. To back to the the Google Wave thing. David, yeah, I want I, you to get a shot in there because I know you use it for your business, right? Yeah, and and it, it's it's everything people say. I I get no emails from from my team. I mean, one or two a year forwarding something else, uh, and, and that really it improves the way I can function as a business because I know any email coming in is from an external. It's something I have to deal with. It's a project I'm 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 following up on or whatever. Um, so not having my email inbox. Um, with 40, 50 emails from my team for stuff I'm working on, not using email as a project management tool, but using it as a communications tool, I'm close to in inbox zero. And when I get an external email, I'm able to respond, uh, an, an external email, I'm able to respond quickly and move my business forward. And it's also just, I feel like I'm, I'm just doing the pitch for, for team management, uh, for team messaging solutions, but it is real. Um, when I get a message from someone in my team on, on Slack, we, we switch around whatever we're using at the time. It's not just what is my teammate want now? Oh, the sales thing is lighting up. That proposal has been reviewed and I need to look at it. Oh, the website development chat channel or, or space or whatever is lit up. Um, the new plugin for the website must be live. I, I know what it is before I read it. It's, it's so helpful to contextualize what you're doing. And and I, I'm going to disagree with you, Dave. I do think it is going to take over. Um, I, I don't think it's going to completely kill email the way way some people are claiming it will, because it's hard to get your externals all on the same platform that you're using. You know, if we all agree, if everyone switches to Microsoft Teams and everyone else goes out of business, then it might take over email. But I think it's killed UC. I mean, think of traditional UC you see products, the companies aren't pushing them anymore. They're pushing their versions of team messaging solutions instead. Uh, Cause you see was just, it was team messaging light. You know, it had presence, it had IM, it had no project workflow. It had no project management. It had no real team support. Um, and I think if you want, we can call team messaging the new UC. Wow. Well, or call it the new C because it's hardly universal at this point um, or unified. Um, but but right, original so, UC wasn't either. <laughs> no, I just want to make one last point on this one, because I think it's important that we understand that that we no one can sit there and wait for one answer, right? Uh, Mr. Maldo said, uh, you know, let's wait for Microsoft to. But he, you didn't really say that, but I'm paraphrasing you. Um, wait till Microsoft goes uh, wins and everyone else goes out of business. I mean, one horrifying that would be for everybody. I mean, Amen, you know, no innovation. Yeah. But also. Um, Everybody knows I didn't say that. That was not me talking. That was Simon. No, no, no. That was David sure Maldo. No, really David Maldo that. said it first. Ish. Yeah. But I don't care who said it. It wasn't point. me. Anyone <laughs> manufacturer takes over. There will never be a point because the ha history would indicate this is true. There will never be a point where somebody wins it all. You know, when I first, well, not quite, but in my first few years in business, word perfect, compact PCs, and Novell netware. Oh, that was the obvious. No one's going to supplant those. Novell owned the network. Um, WordPerfect owned the file format. And uh, Compaq, well, micro, uh, IBM had murdered itself with microchannel architecture, and Compaq was the obvious player. And it was right until the point where it wasn't. And that was an accession event. It changed the market. Uh, Windows came out and changed everything. And I think that that's what will happen here in some format. It will, it'll all look like the right answer right until the point where, well, that was a stupid answer and something else becomes the right answer. Okay, guys. Yeah, there's final... gonna, oh, I just want to say that there's going to be no winner, and, and that's why we're still going to have email. If, if by some terrible twist of fate there was a winner, then maybe we can all use that and not use email, but thankfully there won't be a winner. Um, so we're going to still be using email for a long time.
Okay, so so let, let, this is my favorite part, guys. Get out your balls. Get out your crystal balls. Uh, we'll go back and look at this a year from now. But, Tim, let's start with you. Uh, what do you see as being the, your prediction, the uh, new trend, new piece, new follow-up, something that's going to happen in our space uh, next year as we turn the calendar page? Uh, I don't know that it's new. I think I'm going to say it's a continuation, and then back to something we talked about before, and that's the elimination of hardware. Uh, that's the elimination of hardware and the greater reliance on the network itself and on soft, software. And I, I almost said soft codex, but that's just one element, right? In in the UC space, we've talked about several things. All of these are software driven. And what does the software need to work? It needs the network, right? So uh, a lot of these boxes and, and, and pieces that we have relied on for years some you know people in our audience have sold for years and, and and made good margin on those are going away so the importance of understanding the network understanding how what your software is doing on the network and the ability to get and mine the data out of that software to better serve your client but also to to make your your company more profitable i think is going to be increasingly important good thoughts thank you david your crystal ball yeah, um, you know, I, I expect all the trends that we're talking about to continue, intelligent tracking, um, um, huddle rooms and whatnot. Uh, what I'd like to see, maybe this is more of a, a wish list than a prediction, is I'd like to see more integration of workflow into, into cloud video solutions, uh, going beyond communications. I saw a blog a couple of days ago from BlueJeans, since we're using them, I'll say something nice about them, because I really was excited about this. They have a new feature where you're in meetings, if you mouse over someone's name or face, their LinkedIn information pops up. Oh, hmm. That's that's cool to me. If you're on a sales call and, you know, is this the right person to sell to? Oh, they're the CMO. This is the right person to sell to. I mean, so many applications, but not just, okay, I want LinkedIn and blue jeans. I like that as an example of the way to think. What are people using video for? What are their, whether it's Slack or Google Docs or, or whatever. How can we bring that in in a way that makes sense and make this really more than a, a communications tool, but a workflow tool? Good thoughts. Simon? Oh, I think a few things. I think that there will be more consolidation. I don't think the Microsoft, uh, sorry, the Cisco Broadsoft thing is by any means the last of these. So I suspect there'll be more of those. Either people trying to get a march on their competitors or bulk up to compete with others. Uh, I think that's going to be interesting. Uh, I think at a manufacturer level or in the VC space specifically, if you want to talk about that niche, I think that huddle spaces are going to be continuing to roar away. It's I won't go into the numbers right now because I don't want to turn it into an advert, but the market is changing shape dramatically in that space. And I would agree with Mr. Maldo that I think video uh, as a is going away as a product and is becoming part of a, of a larger workflow. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's, for the first time in 25 years, we might actually move from a, a push sale to a pull one and get away from that whole conversation you were having, David uh, Danto, about the user saying, oh my God, I'd never touch that thing. It'll explode and destroy the building. Um, that's always the implication. I think people are going to become much more comfortable with it. And I, I'm excited about it, honestly. Okay, great thoughts. Uh, for for my crystal ball, I'm I'm still stuck on looking at the concept of voice first. I think we're going to see many with 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 the Google Home product, um, uh, with Cortana, with uh, with. I can't say the names of the other ones because they're going to go off in the room as I say them. <laughs> but, with, but with all of the with all of the other products that are out there, I think we're going to be moving to that voice assistant AI. Uh, support that's going to move into the workflow into the enterprise you're going to see a heck of a lot more of that going forward so so thank you very much for watching that's it for this episode of connected uh, from AV nation tv for all the good people there my name is david danto i look forward to seeing you next time which is more than likely going to be my annual show from the floor of the consumer electronics show or ces as they prefer that we call it now uh, looking at all the new high-tech trends and the toys that are coming out so thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you then